BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at bcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, we want to thank you for joining us on the program today. And I know it's going to be an eye-opener to many of us here across the nation as we listen to the information that we're going to be talking about today. If I use the term gender side, you might say, well, Jim, you misspoke. Didn't you mean genocide? Well, in fact, it kind of is genocide, but uh, we're talking about gender side today on Crosstalk. It is our privilege to have with us Dr. James Garrow, the founder and executive director of the Bethune Institute's Pink Pagoda Schools, private English immersion schools for Chinese children. Uh, Today he runs some 168 schools with nearly 6,300 employees. He has spent over $25 million over the past 16 years rescuing an estimated 40,000 baby Chinese girls from near certain death under China's one-child-per-couple policy by facilitating international adoptions. He was nominated for the 2009 Nobel Peace Prize, where he would be runner-up to the eventual winner, President Barack Obama. He is the author of the newly released book, The Pink Pagoda, One Man's Quest to End Gendercide in China. And uh, Jim, nice to have you with us today on Crosstalk. Well, thanks for having me by. Uh, many in the West, I think, are, are just totally oblivious to the gender side that's going on in China. And today we want to heighten our, our listener awareness to this ongoing atrocity. But let's, let's first of all define what we're talking about. Uh, when you use the term gender side here in your book, what are you referring to? We're really talking about the murder of baby girls when they're born, right after birth. Wow. And what is the root cause? I mean, why, is, why are girls being murdered? Well, it's a, a cultural preference that goes back 5,000 years in history in China. Uh, males are to be preferred because, of course, uh, uh, the passing on of wealth and status and then the requirement that males, uh, the responsibility for, they're responsible for looking after the elderly parents. Uh, so when a female gets married uh, to another a person, uh, she takes on the responsibility along with the husband for taking care of his parents, not her own. How big a problem is gender side in China? Do you you have any kind of numbers that you could make us aware of? Are you sitting down? I I am. Eight million a year. Now, remember, this is gender side. This is infanticide against females, not including the abortion numbers. Eight million a year, infanticide. A year. Eight million. It's staggering. It is absolutely staggering. And in the course of 12 years of running our program, at horrendous expense, we've only managed to save 40, it's now 44,000. But my goodness, it's a drop in the bucket. And how do those numbers compare when you add abortion? Any idea how many abortions are committed in China? I have no idea. Okay, but about 8 million uh, deaths of baby girls taking place. Uh, Now, we think of the Holocaust as being horrific, and it was. How do the killings that we saw happen during the Holocaust compare to what is taking place in the Chinese gender side? Well, you're talking uh, over a five-year period, or a six-year period, sorry, you were talking about six million Jews uh, who were murdered. We're talking about eight million baby girls murdered every single year. That really puts it a little bit more into perspective for us. I mean, we we talk about the atrocities and the horrificness of the Holocaust, but that is just a drop in the bucket to what's taking place here. Yes, and you know, the the Chinese are not, uh, you know, animals. They're not uh, horrid people. They've been saddled with this tragic event uh, as a result of the leadership, the early leadership of Mao, and then later on, Deng Xiaoping. And it all comes from the desire to control the Han, the largest ethnic population, uh, in China by restricting them to only one child uh, per family. And that's continued on, even though uh, what it's doing uh, to the country is cultural suicide down the road by, the, by skewing the birth ratios between males and females. When did you first learn of this gender side taking place, and, and, and what uh, caused you to say, I've got to get involved? What was the incident that caused you to, to, to get involved in this matter? Well, back in the mid-90s, of course, I was starting schools in China, having been a president of a college in Toronto. I'd been invited to China by some of our students, and I went, and I was honored by them. 
And they, uh, they saw a great business opportunity and asked me if I'd help them uh, to start English language schools, and, and so we did. But in one of our schools, uh, one of our assistants uh, came into the office one day, and she was just devastated, sobbing uncontrollably. And when we had comforted her and, and found out what it was, her sister had given birth to a baby uh, girl, and the husband was demanding that they kill the girl in order to make way for a possible son. That's amazing. I mean, just, just outright kill the baby. Yes. Yeah, they call it setting aside. But it's Setting aside. Yeah, yeah, but that's uh, what it was. It was killing, killing the baby. So uh, I couldn't take that. I mean, I'd, I'd heard about this. I'd, it'd been rumored, you know. Uh, you hear about it. That's uh, you know the one-child policy, and you know they kill baby girls. But you never think you're going to run a, up a, a against it directly. Mm-hmm. So I, I just said to the the young girl, her name is Shinyi, um, you tell your sister that uh, I want that baby, and we'll come over there at halfway across China. We'll we'll come. And we'll take control of this baby. Uh, we don't want to see it die. And uh, what ensued after? Well, we, we did. We went, uh, we went over there, uh, got the baby, brought it back to our headquarters, and then we had to figure out what to do with it, <laughs> frankly, because now we had, had a baby girl. Mm-hmm. And um, as it is, I played hockey um, on Friday nights, and it was Americans versus Canadians. Um, and one of these guys, I'm, I was a goalie, and one of these big goons from Boston, he'd, he'd gone to Harvard, actually, uh, came whipping down the ice, didn't stop. Instead of, you know, deflecting the puck and stopping, uh, he keeps going, knocks me through the net into the backboards, and, of course, after that, you're supposed to buy a round of, of beer or whatever it is you drink. And so this guy and I are sitting there chatting away. I have just rescued this baby. We've had it in our possession for only two days. The girls in the office were taking care of, of her, and um, this guy's lamenting the fact that his wife and him can't have uh, babies. Hmm. So, uh, and he's talking about, well, we want to adopt, but man, the price, and there's years-long waiting lists, and, you know, um, the light's going on in my head. I'm a little slow, but ding, you know, there it went on. Here's a guy looking for a baby, and I have a baby. So I asked him if he'd be interested in, in, if he could have a baby immediately, would they adopt now? And uh, fortunately, the man had to go to the bathroom, so he was off to the bathroom before he gave me an answer. And in the bathroom, he asked one of my employees, um, is this guy okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is he for real? What's mm-hmm. he talking about? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, well, he's got a baby. Listen to the story. You'll love it. So he came back with a little bit different attitude, and then um, in five minutes, he phoned his wife. And uh, they agreed that they would uh, take this baby, and that started me in a whole adventure. Well, yeah, and that's uh, I mean, what what then? I mean, you've a- actually rescued close to forty thousand b- baby Chinese girls from that single incident. Uh, you actually came about something called the Pink Pagoda Campaign. So, what took you from that initial action to just a, a full fledged measure to save these baby girls? Well, what, what happened, I, I, I really thought that uh, God was prompting me. Um, early on in my life, uh, we, had, uh, we have four children, uh, but our twins, the last two, uh, one of the boys was born dead, and they had to resuscitate uh, Evan. And um, I remember them wheeling him off uh, to, you know, in kind of an emergency way and wheeling my wife off in another direction, and I was left to head down to the little chapel uh, in the hospital, and um, I basically made a promise to God. It's one of those bargain things, you know, Lord, help me here, mm. and I'll do whatever you want. And um, it wasn't until I had the opportunity to save the baby, the first baby, and then Shinyi, that same girl, comes to my office just a, about a week later, and she leans in the door and she says, Mr. Jim, we have two more babies. And that's when I knew. Mm. Two more babies, and now what am I going to do? Now what am I going to do, exactly. Mm-hmm. So um, I just knew that was the call of God. That was him saying, you know, step up to the plate. Um, I'm calling you on your promise. Now, is, is the Pink Pagoda campaign, are, are you an adoption agency? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, we're totally illegal, and, you know, it, it may you know, kind of surprise you or shock you that we are, but uh, it's illegal for a parent, a set of uh, able-bodied parents, to give up a child uh, for adoption. 
There is no provision for that in Chinese society and law. So we break the law by taking from the parent that wants to give up the baby rather than murder it, giving it to us, and then us handing it off to a, a parent who is interested in adopting. They call that trafficking in human flesh. Now, there's no money. You know, we're not buying a baby. We're not selling a baby. In fact, we bear all the costs. But the United Nations, uh, the Geneva Convention, calls that trafficking in human flesh the old description uh, of the slave trade. So you are, in essence, considered a criminal? I am. But, you know, keep in mind, the guys who helped the Underground Railroad in the United States to, for slaves to uh, escape were considered to be criminals, as were anyone in Germany who was helping a Jew escape. They would uh, lose their lives. So you, in essence, can't hang a shingle out in front of a storefront saying, bring your babies here, can you? No, but I have a whole wonderful crew of people out there gathering information, preparing the way. Uh, to save babies. Now, we understand that uh, by being involved in rescuing these baby girls, you have risked your family, you've risked uh, your own safety, you've risked employees. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, we've had uh, we've had some incidents. Uh, two of our employees were killed um, in a far-flung province in, in a little town uh, when they ran up against uh, the baby stealers, the, the folks who stole babies to sell them into the sex trade. And uh, our two folks had their their throats slit, actually. Um, and uh, you know, at every point in time, uh, every turn, there there could have been uh, the police, the public security bureau. There could have been the uh, People's Liberation Army Intelligence Corps. Uh, they could have grabbed us at any point. In fact, I discovered that uh, I had been trailed uh, and tracked for eight months by a whole team of the PLA intelligence service. They were trying to find out if I was the kind of guy who was a crook, was a, was a bad man, uh, and should they kill me. Well, <laughs> well, they discovered that I was a good guy, that I was doing a good thing. And the head of that security service uh, actually came and met with me. And, again, that opens a whole new set of doors and circumstances. And, really, it was a godsend. So the Chinese government is aware of your services? Very much. And the levels. Are, are they expressing any opposition to it? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no one's expressing it directly. We've had lots of hints. But you have to remember, in my schools, I've had Hu Jintao's niece, the president of China, the two new guys coming up, Xi and Bo, their children have been in our schools. So we've rubbed shoulders with the top dogs of the society in China. Okay, let's talk about... Uh, that's uh, God just opening it. Let's talk about those schools. Uh, tell us about the schools that you're running. Well, we have a, a number of different uh, styles of school. 58, for example, uh, nursery school, English language nursery schools. Um, the public schools in China provide English language instruction from grade 3 on. But if you're wealthy, you'll send your child from kindergarten or nursery school uh, into one of our styles of school to get way ahead with the English language. Uh, the others, we have some Ontario high schools. We have some certified high schools from Canada. Uh, we've also helped some Americans uh, develop schools there. We're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. We're talking with uh, Dr. Jim Garrow today. He is the author of the newly released book, The Pink Pagoda, One Man's Quest to End Gender Side in China. You're listening to Crosstalk on the VCY America Network. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, creation scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, are crocodiles included among the dinosaurs? No, they're not, Chris. Evolutionists think that they evolved before the dinosaurs and have lived ever since. But the more we study crocodiles, which are identical to fossil crocodiles, we find that they are amazingly complex. There's nothing primitive about them at all. For instance, those warty bumps on the crocodile skin and head, they're not just bumps. They're actually nerve receptors and send signals directly to the brain. Thus, a crocodile lying partially submerged in the water knows what's going on all around him, even before he can see or hear or smell anything. Chris, all animals were created on days 5 and 6 of creation week, including the crocodiles and the dinosaurs and the mammals. None of them are primitive. All of them were very good at the start. And that start was back in Genesis. To find out more about creation science, visit us on the web at www.icr.org. That's www.icr.org.
folks, sad to say, gendercide is taking place in China. This is uh, murder after birth. Eight million baby girls a year that are being murdered because of their gender. We're talking today with Dr. James Garrow, who is the founder and executive director of the Bethune Institute's Pink Pagoda Schools, private English immersion schools for Chinese children. And uh, he is uh, estimated to have saved some close to 40,000 baby Chinese girls from near certain death under the one child per couple policy in China by uh, facilitating the the, uh, international adoptions, I believe it is. Right, Jim? Partly international and, uh, for the most part, though, uh, internal adoptions uh, with the Chinese people themselves. So you're running these schools, and Chinese leaders respect greatly the work that you're doing and actually coming to you wanting to place their own children in your schools. (laughs) Yeah, it's really bizarre when you end up having somebody who runs the nation or runs uh, the government of a province or of a region, like the largest city in the world, Chongqing, uh, 31 million people, and you've never heard of it. (laughs) Hmm. And it's the largest city in the world. But, you know, here the person who ran uh, that area, uh, who is about to become, uh, in place of Hu Jintao, he's about to become the new president of China. And he sat down with me and uh, convinced me uh, that his children should be allowed into my schools. So do they kind of turn a blind eye toward the work you're doing? I mean, they're fully aware of what you're doing. Yeah, they are. Um, well, they know I'm doing a good thing, and, and um, for them, it's a relief, especially with respect to the, the military, the People's Liberation Army. Um, they're some of our largest uh, client base, if you want to call it that, a client base. Um, they're the people who turn to us for the most part, uh, right across the nation. What is a penalty to parents in China who violate the one-child policy? Well, uh <laughs> To have a second child uh, costs you 11 times your annual salary, or kill the child, or oh. give it to Jim Garrow. <laughs> oh, my. But they don't make that necessarily an option, do they? No. I mean, that's not on their list. Yeah, sadly, yeah. But our folks are out there beating the bushes, letting people know. Uh, I call them coffee drinkers, you know, the pink pagoda people. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to, by the way, there is actually no pink pagoda itself. It's a name that we started to use just to describe to people, you know, because people keep saying, you know, well, you know, your baby-saving thing. Um, so we gave it a name. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's easy to describe. Um, does China realize where they're heading as far as the uh, vast ratio difference in, in the future? You know, it's, uh, it, to me, I'm shaking my head, and most people are when they realize the, the, the skewing of the demographics. 100, uh, 100 females are usually born to 105 males, and uh, in China today, the ratio is 100 to 126, which is insanity. It's cultural suicide. So they've set up uh, just the most difficult circumstance for themselves, but there seems to be no end in it. Uh, you know, all, the, all of us who are on the outside looking in or in China looking at what's going on, uh, we're wondering what is going on and why the leadership isn't changing. But there doesn't seem to be any budging. Now, you had mentioned that uh, the United Nations uh, considers your work to be that of human trafficking. Um, how did this quest for a Nobel Peace Prize come about? Oh, it, it really wasn't a quest uh, right. on my part. I, I mm-hmm. got this call, phone call one, one night, uh, sorry, one day. I was there uh, midnight in China, I guess, when the guy phoned me. But he identified himself as the president of a, uh, a well-respected university in China, and he said to me that uh, I had been, uh, you know, instrumental in saving uh, his granddaughter. And he wanted to, in honor of uh, the work that we were doing, to nominate me for the Nobel Peace Prize. And I was blown away. I just about fell off my chair, you know, when we got the call. Uh, and he wanted permission. He wanted my permission to move ahead and do that. And, of course, you know, what an honor. I mean, I couldn't say no. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, uh, you know, really, uh, it, he wanted to honor what we had done. And uh, wonderful thing. So uh, somebody else took that award rather than yourself. Some tall, thin, black fella <laughs> lives in a round house or... <laughs> a white house, anyways. Yeah, or a white one, anyway, in Washington. Um, now, 
One would think that our political leaders are fully aware of this gender side. Why would we not be seeing more outrage from the White House and Congress in the U.S., from the prime minister and parliament in Canada? Why not a greater outrage from the, re- from the West when we know exactly what's going on? Well, the difficulty is that the philosophy uh, that allows abortion is the same philosophy that would allow infanticide, and you just stretch it down the road of reason, and you have the killing of the infirm, and uh, you have the killing of the old people. Uh, It just seems to be a slippery slope. In fact, a number of years ago in the 60s, there was a gentleman named Dr. Francis Schaeffer, Mm -hmm. and uh, an ethicist, uh, a very wise man who wrote some books. One of them was uh, How Should We Then Live? But Mm -hmm. he challenged Americans to the whole notion of being very careful of the slippery slope, that the philosophy and the thinking behind, the rationale behind adoption, uh, or, uh, sorry, abortion, where it would lead, and the natural next stage would be infanticide, and then, of course, uh, euthanasia. Now, it's kind of interesting to note that you have dedicated your life to saving these baby Chinese girls, and yet the one who took the Nobel Peace Prize is one who advocated for the taking of life after a failed abortion attempt in the Born Alive Infants Act, none other than Barack Obama. Tell us that. About well, that. You know, it's a, it's a really strange thing that here you, here you have that circumstance, yes. But, you know, the man, <laughs> Barack Obama himself, he didn't just vote for it. He sponsored the bill, which is just to me, I mean, in other words, he was one of the guys who wrote it and then brought it and then browbeat everybody uh, in the Illinois Senate to, uh, to see it passed. So this man has been active uh, in his work to create a scenario of infanticide. Jim, does it take you by surprise to see the recent mandates that have come down from the Obama administration as far as the uh, forced uh, birth control through health insurance policies, sterilization just last week now requiring all college plans, health plans, to offer free sterilizations to all college women? Uh, Does that take you by surprise in light of these things? Not, not in the least. Uh, it, sadly, uh, you just have to look at China, where not only do they do the things you described, but if a woman is pregnant and it's her second baby in China, you'll see them come to the door, the police, drag them off and force the abortion of that baby. Now, think about it. It's the same philosophy. And if government is going to dominate to the point of tyranny, then you have a circumstance that you're headed into as, as a nation. So do you believe that we're in danger in the West and following in China's footsteps? Oh, absolutely. I mean, China's the model for Obama. And by the way, what's very interesting is the treatment that he receives in China, because he's not an honored person in China at all. So what is the treatment he receives? Oh, they, they call him an awful name. Hmm. Uh, that the common man calls him uh, by a very, very, very bad name. <laughs> Are you putting your life uh, and your organization in jeopardy by releasing this book, The Pink Pagoda? Yes, to a degree we are. Uh, On the one hand, we are cementing our position. On the other hand, we're advertising our position and thereby bringing on some uh, even more, uh, a deeper risk than we've had in the past. And um, uh, yet you felt it was more important to get the story out to the world? When I see what's happening in the United States today, uh, we we had to step forward and say, look, this is where this is going. Uh, be aware, America. Um, you are really the moral compass of the world. And uh, if you've lost your way, where's the world going to be? Hmm. Our guest here today is Dr. Jim Garrow. He is the uh, author of this book called The Pink Pagoda, subtitled One Man's Quest to End Gendercide in China. Our VCY bookstore is making this uh, book available at a special discount here through the end of this month. They're offering this book at 23% off the regular price. It's a hardcover book, uh, well over 150 pages. Uh, It's available at this discount through the end of this month at uh, vcy.com, or you can call 1-888-722-4829. The book, hardcover book, normally is twenty five ninety five through the end of the month. They're making it available for nineteen dollars and ninety eight cents. They have some shipping, or there may be some local uh, tax available uh, associated with that as well. But you can call one triple eight seven two two four eight two nine, 
or by going to vcy.com, and you'll find it at the top of the page there on the Pink Pagoda, One Man's Quest and Gendercide in China. And that really begs the question here, Jim. Uh, does or can one person really make a difference? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, again, by the grace of God, I've been given a pr- position of being able to chat with with the rulers, the, the elite of China, a position no one would normally be in except for the love of education and the love of the children that these people have, just like you and I, for our own children. So I get that opportunity, and, and I'm telling you, I'm unabashed. Uh, if someone asks me about my faith, boy, I'm right up front about it, uh, and which, by the way, is the law in China. Uh, if somebody asks you a question, you have every right to answer the question. So um, my students uh, and staff members all over ask me about why are you so different? Um, you know, why are you not just, why are you spending your own money? This is what really gets them. Mm. Why are you spending your own money, you know, your profits? Why are you giving it away instead of, you know, holding on to it or buying another, you know, Bentley or something like that? They're very curious to find somebody who actually puts their money into a mission. So the monies from the school help? fund this? Oh, yes, that's that's the entire funding of it. We, we're we not a charity. Uh, we're a philanthropy, if you want to. So, in other words, when when these Chinese officials were giving you reasons why you should accept their children in your schools, they're actually helping then to fund the very work that you're involved in. And they know full well that that's where it's going. Wow. Folks, I'd like to open the phone lines today for you to speak with our guest today, Jim Garrow. Our number is 1-800-733-9829. 1-800-733-9829. I'd like to hear your questions, your comments today. To our guest, are you concerned about the gender side taking place in China? Eight million every single year? Uh, we talk about uh, just abortion alone in the United States is is half of that amount, and and yet, or far less than half of that, and yet we're seeing on a yearly basis, annual basis, eight million girls that are being murdered just because they're a girl. Um, how has this impacted you, Jim? Well, it's changed me totally. Uh, I mean, I used to be just a money grubber, <laughs> just like everyone else, you know, looking for profit, mm-hmm. looking for the, the next uh, dollar and the next uh, new school, new relationship. Um, and it really changed the value of a dollar. It costs, it costs about $1,000 to save a baby girl. So, I mean, I can't look at a new car. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> all I think about is the number of thousands of dollars that it takes to buy that new car. Hmm. You know, if it's 35000 that's 35 babies. Well, I can't buy a new car. Are there ways that people here in, in the States or Canadian listeners, how they can get involved with your work? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things. One, if you look on page 105, those of you who are going to buy the book, in, on page 105 you'll discover that we use airplanes. Now, I'm not going to say anything else about airplanes, but um, if you were thinking about giving money to something that would be helpful uh, in China and impactful on the work that we do, Mission Aviation Fellowship, that's one place you could give. The other thing is I, I'm being informed that... Uh, a group is, is forming Pink Pagoda Girls, and it has to do with raising money, uh, $1,000 at a time, um, to save a baby girl. Hmm. Well, folks, let's uh, take your phone calls here today on Crosstalk 800-733-9829. We're going to take a quick break, and after the break, we're going to come to your calls here and uh, have you make your comments uh, and ask your questions here today of our guest, Dr. Jim Garrow. And as we mentioned, he is author of The Pink Pagoda, One Man's Quest to End Gendercide in China. Were you aware it was going on to this magnitude? We'll be right back. Most people think of Freemasonry as a secretive but benevolent fraternity. But what exactly is it? Is it more than it seems on the surface? In the handy size booklet, authors John Ankerberg, John Weldon, and Dylan Burroughs present thought-provoking information, answering such questions as, What do the Masons teach about Jesus, salvation, and life after death? What do Masonic symbols represent? Is the God of the Bible also the God of the Lodge? Are Masonry and Christianity compatible? Can Christians join the Lodge in good conscience? The booklet provides a careful examination of Masonry compared to biblical truth. 
To obtain your copy of The Facts on the Masonic Lodge, send a donation of $8 or more to VCY America, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. To make your donation by phone, call 1-800-729-9829. That's 1-800-729-9829. You're listening to Crosstalk here on VCY America. Jim Garrow is our guest here, author of The Pink Pagoda, One Man's Quest to End Genderside in China. Taking your phone calls today at 800-733-9829. We're going to begin in Alabama, and Willie, you're on the air. Yes, hello. How are you all today? We're fine. Thank you for your call. Good. I, uh, I want to disagree with this doctor on the right of the book. I'm a truck driver, and I may have come in in the middle of the conversation but I disagree that things are going to happen like that in the United States. Um, and one of the good points that he did say concerning is we, we, this country was kind of raised up on those religious beliefs. But one thing about those religious beliefs is that it's what God said, that these things were going to happen. And, and even if they do happen, what are we going to do to stop it? Like over there in China, those people have been doing this for years. Uh, they're not going to reform. Some of them are not going to reform. They're going to continue to do it. Uh, and my last point is, or question is, when is the time that God talks about that these things are going to start happening in the world, like uh, what he says is going to happen to the United States. Okay, Willie, we're going to address those issues. Uh, thank you for the call. Uh, let me ask you, Jim, are, um, you know, this fatalistic attitude, well, we know things are going to get bad in, in, you know, in the end times in this world. Do we sit back and do nothing about it? Oh, no. Uh, the fact that the Scripture speaks to what happens in the, in the last days doesn't in any way obviate our responsibility uh, to stand up for good. And the gentleman is correct. You know, it's not as if this is a fait accompli. It's not as if it's, it's inevitable. Um, we have to look at it uh, as we, we're here, we're the salt, we're the light in this world. So we have a chance to influence for good. And we should be standing up at every point in time declaring what is right and what the Word of God says. I mean, when we take a look at what we are doing here in America, I mean, not too many years ago, we saw the Supreme Court decision here back in the early 70s, uh, you know, sanction the killing of life in the womb from, from, from conception all the way up until natural birth. And you referred to Francis Schaeffer, and, and he and C. Everett Koop, as they put that film series together, How Should We Then Live? I mean, they said this is going to lead toward infanticide. This was, is going to lead toward euthanasia. And people said, no, no, you're, you're extremists. It'll never happen. But we're seeing that, Doctor, right here before our very eyes. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, uh, we, we have to stand up, and the churches have to get active, and they have to get proactive, and they have to stand up in the, the pulpits and teach the people. That's the other thing. This is such a shock to folks to hear this. Well, we've skipped a few years of, of teaching about it and warning about it. Well, now we have to get out there and teach the people, because Christians, once they know the facts, it is so horrific, they're going to stand up, they're going to protest, they're going to demand change, and a change of direction of the government. And how many of you are sitting back right now while the Obama administration is saying, yes, we are going to force insurance companies to give uh, abort abortifacients. We're going to uh, make it uh, available for college gals to have f f sterilizations. And we just sit back and when we say, well, you know, what can we do about it? Well, folks, you can do something about it. You need to be informed and then you need to get involved. Let's go next to Ralph calling from Franksville. You're on the air, Ralph. Yeah, Jim. Hi. Hey, this is great for what you're doing. Hey, um, I'm going into the doctor's office right now, but I was, I'm, I'm retired. I'm 65. You need any help doing what you're doing? Sir, you know what? Yes. Uh, give, if you can give somebody your name and address. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm ex-military. I'm just, I'm bored out of my, out of my pants. Like, there's nothing for me to do, you know? And so I was a carpenter uh, for my whole life. And I need something to do, or else I'm going to go crazy. Do you, do you have access to the Internet? Yes, sir. 
Okay, can you go into a World Net Daily, World Net Daily, and take a look in there and email them, telling them that you'd like to get involved in saving babies. And there's something coming down the pipe that I think is going to be just perfect for you. There, there's, so yeah, there's, WorldNetDaily. Yeah, com, right? Uh, yeah, or just go WND.com. That'll get you through to them. All right. Um, what else? That, is that it? Yeah, that's it. And, and uh, you know, very soon there'll be, I think there'll be something announced uh, where uh, all of America can get on board helping babies. This is great. I'll tell you what, this is a, this is a answer to prayer for me. I'll tell you, this is perfect. So, Jim, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, for your call here Hi. today. Next to the state of Ohio, Randy, you're on the air. Hello. I was listening to your program, and it hit hard because my husband is military, and he doesn't agree with Obama anything. Um, also, we have, uh, between us, we have five children. And Amen. <laughs> Hello? Go ahead, Randy. Amen. <laughs> Um, we've adopted seven, at, of course, out of the system, and we're hopefully um, be working on number eight. We're not sure what what the uh, you know progression of that will be, um, but we were looking um, internationally at adoption because we have room for two, and we've looked at different programs, and it just seems like they're selling children is is what I'm getting all these programs. And I just, I just think it's so wrong. And when I heard your program, it just hit me just like a, a brick. Um, I'm gonna, I've already wrote down the information to order the book. That'll be my next call. Um, also, I definitely want to donate. Does the book have that information in it? Yes, but uh, look on WND, WND.com. Uh, uh, okay. Online, that's my pub- the publisher of our book, and mm-hmm. there will be a way to give um, directly to our program uh, and get involved in our program. That's that's where things are going. So you'll have opportunity. But I want to say, God bless you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, you know, one little boy, um, we got first. We we were not foster parents or anything. Um, I've done daycare all of my life for 22 years now. Um, but this little boy in the state of Nevada came into our lives, and he was killed. Oh, my. Hmm. That sounds and terrible. It was, it was a bus accident on his way to school here in Ohio. Oh, boy. But we've adopted seven and hopefully working on number eight right now. But, um, like I said, we have room for two, and we've been looking, you know, to try to help, you know, another child in need, and your program just really hit hard. Um, Well, you know, praise God that he filled your heart with love. Yes. Yes. Um, Is it possible for people in the state to adopt these children? Yes. (laughs) Okay. You, You have to go through the regular channels, unfortunately. We're... Where we're involved is on the Chinese side. We're, we're the ones who, uh, I guess, initially find the babies and save them and then get mm-hmm. them into the adoption centers or uh, another way, too, which we can't describe on air. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Randy, for your call. Uh, Jim, is the best way for any of our listeners then to be in contact with you through WND.com? I think that's best right now, okay. yes. And uh, so in the subject line, what, what would they put a uh, message for Jim Garrow, or what, how would they refer uh, Pink to Pink Pagoda. Pink Pagoda. Okay, so if you put that in your message line uh, through the WND.com website. Thank you so much, uh, Randy, for your call. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I will be in touch. Okay. And by the way, if you'd like to get a copy of the book right now, it is available at a 23% discount through the VCY bookstore, vcy.com, or by calling one 722 Four eight two nine. That's one triple eight seven two two four eight two nine. Trudy, you're next in Wisconsin. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hi. Um, actually, the last caller kind of sort of answered my question. I was wondering how you would go about adopting, and you had said the WND.com was the best route. So I guess I got my answer okay. there. Great. Thank you for your call here today. Uh, to uh, Mobile, Alabama, Robert, you're on the air. Yes. Uh, hello, Robert. Turn your radio off, please. 
Okay. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hello, Robert. You're on the air. Yes, sir. I'm yes. Here. Okay, Robert, I need to have your radio all the way off, please. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we could hear you before. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my point is, is that he, uh, your guest listed several reasons why the Chinese are, are doing what they're doing with the, you know, the killing the, uh, the female babies. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, one thing that I don't, I don't know if you, you mentioned, even through uh, you all's discussion, is that uh, this is a population control program, and China is the model, and the model is because they have so many children, and plus uh, they get rid of the female babies, uh, the females, period. Whenever they want you know, depopulate anything, they usually kill off the females because the females are the, are the incubators, and uh, they don't need to kill off the men. They just need to kill off the women. Is because you you can take one man and repopulate a whole country if you got a lot of females. But if you don't have but one female, then hmm, you can't do too much. But okay, one and Jim. What about this aspect of population control? And you know the the whole thing. This gentleman is correct. The whole thing had to do at the very beginning with with this notion of population control. But it was based really um, in the need, the necessity on the part of Mao Zedong and later Deng Xiaoping to control the largest population group of the country, the Han Chinese. And the Han, of course, were the the group, the ethnic group, uh, where the officials were coming from and the government uh, workers. Um, And he wanted to get control of it. So control the Han and you control the nation. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you for your call. To West Bend and Christine, you're on the air. Yes, um, I wanted to talk about the eugenics program. We actually had several programs like that that were in operation in our country years ago. So it could come back. It was here, and it went to Nazi Germany, and we brought those uh, doctors back here, and they've infiltrated our universities and hospitals and schools with this filthy way of thinking. Mm. to pick certain parts of society that they did not want to reproduce. And it was legal here in the States in certain places yeah. in our past, and it's sad. Well, that, but, that's, that's the very birth of Planned Parenthood. Yep, we're that's not, uh, yeah, we're not going forward. Yeah. We're going backwards. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Margaret Sanger was very much a champion of, of uh, gender side, uh, uh, the uh, eugenics. Uh, I, I, I'm confident, Jim, you've studied that aspect out, too. Yeah. Yeah, and and the, and it, her formation was racist. It was totally about uh, controlling the black population. Mm-hmm. And, and think about think about the people in the United States who, for the most part, are aborting their babies, and it's blacks, and they're being encouraged. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, look at Planned Parenthood. Where do they go? They'll go to the urban centers. They'll go into the central city areas and set up their they set up their shop, and that that gender side. So, or, or actually, the uh, matter of uh, you know racial killing is going on. Eugenics continues on through the auspices of Planned Parenthood. That's that's certainly my observation of what's going on there. And it really has nothing to do with choice for a woman. Yeah. To uh, let's see, Dorothy and Alney, Illinois. You're on the air. Yes. Um, they're killing the girl babies in China still. They've been doing it for years. Mm-hmm. Mm. I read about a year ago, if not more, that the Chinese men are so outnumbered, they cannot find a wife. So why are they still doing this? There's no women there. Tell you what, we're going to thank you for that question. We'll pick that answer up on the other side of the break. You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. Stay with us. We'll be right back. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website is worldviewweekend.com. As I study Romans chapter 1 and I look at the five signs or five consequences that God is removing his hand of protection from a nation, I think I see what's happening to America more clearly. One of the things I must be careful of is the sin or desire to place my family above what God desires for my family. God may very well want my children to live in a nation that is hostile to them so that they might seek him. I have to ask myself as a father, has the materialism of our nation made our children and grandchildren more likely to seek after God? 
Or are they materially satisfied and have need of nothing? If God desires persecution to come to our nation, to get the attention of our children and grandchildren, and to drive them to the cross, I pray for persecution. It's better to be persecuted in this life and come to salvation through Christ than to be comfortable in this life and to be tormented in hell for eternity. For the Worldview Week in Minute, I'm Brandon House. We have with us today the author of the newly released book, The Pink Pagoda, One Man's Quest to End Genderside in China. His name is Dr. Jim Garrow, and uh, taking your calls here at 800-733-9829. Jim, just before the break, Dorothy had called from Olney and, and had asked this question here about the shortage of wives uh, for China. Is that an issue today? Uh, is it an increasing issue for the future? It's a, a cultural suicide issue, frankly, with what they've done. Uh, by messing with the natural birth order, um, normally you'd have 100 females born to about 104 to 106 uh, males. Well, now uh, the, the birth ratio is 100 females to 126 males. It's way out of whack. Uh, and as she points out, uh, the women are just not there to be married. So now you have a burgeoning military, because that's the answer. Uh, that's what they do in China. They put all of these aggressive males into the military and provide them with a home uh, and loyalties and a family-like atmosphere. How does the religion of Buddhism play into this matter? Greatly, uh, because they believe that uh, uh, when you die, you come back again as a, in another iteration, another form, and depending on whether you've been a good person or, or whatever or a bad person, you either go up the chain or down the chain. And uh, their thought is that if a baby is killed, a baby girl, for example, who is innocent, uh, they will come back probably in a better form, which would be as a man. Wow. Okay, let's go to the state of Texas. Esmer, you're on the air. Thanks for calling. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. I was wanting to ask what your take is. I have this idea that uh, President Obama's um, um, issue on abortion and free birth control is really population control, but uh, if he calls it population control, he won't have support. So he's calling it a woman's freedom and a woman's rights. Hmm. Yeah, he couches think? a lot of things in terms that, uh, if he used the real term, he would get no support. Uh, but you're absolutely right. That's where I see it. And, and remember, I'm a Canadian just looking, looking from uh, the north down into what's going on in the U.S., and we are appalled with what we see. Uh, going on, and it's headed for uh, exactly that, population control. Keep in mind, in China, they drag women who are pregnant with that second child. They drag them off to be aborted. Wow. Esmer, Thank thanks you. for the call. Nancy in Pasco, Washington, you're on the air. Yeah, uh, just a curiosity question, because, you know, I've listened to the whole program, and I got my radio off, but um, anyway, if they if they kill all these baby girls... And um, and so there's not going to be any baby girls growing up, and here's these men and stuff, you know, when they are old enough to get married or, what, you know, to help produce babies. But what about the women that are are producing babies now when, when they grow old and they can't help produce babies anymore? Then... Um, then what's going to happen, you know? Um, I don't know if I'm asking the question right or, you know, the curiosity question right or not. No, absolutely right. Um, we, we touched earlier on the fact of the teaching of uh, Dr. Francis Schaeffer, who warned America about uh, the slippery slope of abortion leading into infanticide and uh, into eugenics and then into euthanasia, killing off the infirm and killing off the aged. Um, and you know that's the joy of Christianity. We have we have a heart. We have love, uh, and this other stuff that's going on is godless. It's uh, and it's out of a, of a pagan influence, unfortunately. Thanks for the call here, Nancy. To Dave in Michigan, you're on the air. Hello. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I just had a question. I was wondering, uh, do the Chinese couples, if they have uh, one boy already, and if they have another boy, do they get punished as harshly? Uh, versus, you know, equally uh, with the girl as the boy, or do they make arrangements if the couple has two boys? 
No, it's the same thing. Uh, they, they're fined 11 times their annual salary uh, for that second child. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you, Dave, for your call here. We're not able to take any more calls due to the briefness of time that we have before us, but uh, it's a huge issue here, folks. And, uh, Jim, what is your burden for China in, in this regard? Well, I'd like this whole thing to stop. Uh, frankly, that's, uh, that's for saving the baby girls. But uh, more than that is, is the whole notion that this country, that whole country, uh, needs uh, our Savior. Mm, amen. And how, how can our listeners best be praying for you and your work? Well, just that the doors continue to be open to, to our folks and that there be protection uh, and that we're wise in what we do. You actually see this as a national tragedy, don't you? I do. Yeah, these poor folks have, uh, have been forced into something that uh, is just beyond uh, belief, even for them, and it's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Is there room for additional organizations like yours to get started up and working in, in the same capacity? It, it'd, be, it'd be great if, if there could be, um, and I'd welcome that. <laughs> Pink Pagoda 2. <laughs> Pink Pagoda 2, yes. Well, folks, it is a national tragedy that has taken place, and uh, the gender side that's going on in China. Uh, let me ask you this, Jim, are other nations at this same point? Uh, India. India has, has a huge problem, and I've, I've been approached by many Indians uh, with respect to helping helping in their country, and, uh, you know, we, we have discussions underway. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you'd like to obtain a copy of the brand-new book called The Pink Pagoda, its subtitle is One Man's Quest to End Gender Sight in China. You'll, you'll read a story in here, and uh, he's described by the United Nations as a criminal that's engaged in human trafficking, and that is he is out to save Chinese baby girls. 40,000 baby girls saved from gender side, a fate tied to the one-child policy of that nation. Uh, his book, it's a hardcover book, it's available through the end of the month at the discounted rate through the VCY Bookstore, 23% uh, off the regular price, a hardcover book. Uh, you can call the bookstore at one 722 that's one 722 or going online at vcy.com. Uh, to correspond with our guest, you'll have to do it through uh, his publisher, uh, through WorldNet Daily at WND.com. We have about 30 seconds. Jim, if you'd like to share a closing thought with our listeners. Well, I just appreciate the opportunity and, and frankly, uh, to, to discuss this. But, you know, America is the, the last vestige of freedom in the world. And as we look at America and see your freedoms being stripped away, we see America following the Chinese path. And we just pray to God that uh, he stays his hand of judgment on America hmm. and gives you a way out. Jim, thank you so much for being with us today and for the important work that you continue to do. Thank you. Jim Garrow has been our guest here. Thanks for joining us on Crosstalk. Folks, we need to be praying uh, in regard to this matter. And uh, just as this man's prayer was, Lord, what would you have me do? I'm willing to do what you've called me to do. Thanks for joining us today on Crosstalk. been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the internet from VCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208, or download by RSS or podcast from CrosstalkAmerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. Crosstalk.